And I think everyone, we're just going to go ahead and get started. My name is Celeste Feta. I'm the Director of Education at VMFA, and my co-presenter today is Amy Smith. VMFA Studio School Instructor. A little bit about Amy, she um, graduated from VCU with a degree in printmaking and painting and is a professional artist as well. She teaches drawing at the Studio School, I think intro to drawing, um, and possibly a few other classes coming up in the fall um, and the summer. Um, and she also studied in France um, in an école. So she's got the personal experience to back up um, the theme for today, which is training like an artist, again, uh, to sort of walk you through the process that Americans who are studying in Paris, um, who are highlighted in our exhibition, Le Sort de Cassat, Americans in Paris, might have gone through. Um, and we're going to do that by using works from our permanent collection at the museum, three works. And we'll take you through similar exercise, well, not similar, they're a little bit modified for uh, our modern times, but they are the steps, um, similar to steps that artists would have gone through in this process. So um, what's gonna happen today, I'll talk about that process and talk a little bit about the works of art we're gonna focus on. And then Amy, I'll turn it over to Amy, who's gonna take us through some of those drawing exercises. So. If you have a paper, piece of paper with you and a pencil, that would be great if you'd like to participate in the drawing components. And if not, that's okay too. It's okay to, to listen in um, as well. So uh, learning in the academic tradition or with the ACOLE. So before you even got to the ACOLE, you actually could do some practice sessions <laughs> at an atelier so that would be where an artist would have a workshop or at the Academy Julian, which was sort of like a precursor to the ACOL, sort of like middle school before you got to high school kind of, kind of idea. And some students would stay at that academy or an atelier. It could be up, you know, a month up to three years. And while they were there, they would do similar things as they would do in the ACOL. So step one, you would draw from a plaster cast and for, you know, a couple of weeks or, or months sometimes. And this would take place Monday through Saturday. So six days a week, two hour sessions at a time, multiple sessions. And step two, you would move on to drawing from a life model. Step three is when you would begin painting. Um, and in 1863, they introduced this step. And step four, you would get into critiques, bi-weekly critiques um, at the atelier or the um, acad academia. In between, you'd also copy old masters at the Louvre. And of course, there would be exams throughout this process. And I'll talk about the exam process as we go from work to work. Um, and then you would sit final exam um, and the big prize was a pre to Rome. And I'll talk about that um, in our last work today. So even before you could be called a student though, um, you went through all of this preliminary testing uh, to become a pupil and you would be a pupil for about six months. And then you would have to start all over again and test again to become a full fledged student. Um, and again, that would then, then you would go into this, this process of testing, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to call all of you pupils today um, instead of students as we go through our, and now we're not grading you for real, but you know, we're going to go through the motions um, and, and go through this process together. So let's see. So I do want to veer off just real quickly and talk about the difference between if you were a female artist going through this process versus a male artist. So female artists were not admitted to the Ecole until 1897. Uh, so that's well after some of the artists that we were gonna, you know, you can see in the exhibition today would have started. So all of the female artists before 1897 went through this entire process at the Academy Julian. So they never were, they weren't admitted to the Ecole. Now, and even in the Academy Julian didn't start doing this until 1873. So pictured here is an image from the Beaux Arts after they were admitted to, admitted to women. And even then, women were never permitted to draw from the nude. 
um, in the academy um, or the ACOL. So the work on the right that you see, the drawing on the right and the painting there are both by an artist named Cecilia Bow. Both of these are in the exhibition. And you can see that that male model is not nude. So he is clothed um, and that is because that's how she would have had access to, to draw him. So just keep that in mind. It just took a while for women to be admitted. Now, I mentioned the first step would be drawing from a plaster cast, and that's on the left. There's a drawing by an artist named Julian Weir, distance thrower. And these were usually Roman copies. The, the A. Cole had about 50 plaster casts in its collection, and students would draw from that from that same one cast. So there'd be sort of a ring of students and you can see this in the painting of where someone's, they're drawing from a live, live model at an atelier. So you can kind of imagine the students sitting in an auditorium all drawing from the same cast and they would be sort of competing against one another sort of to see you know who could get the best or the prize in these sessions. Um, and before they were even admitted to that part, remember they were at the academy before they went to the ACOL, and they would sit these tests. And the test would be drawing from the past plaster cast um, in a timed period. And then they would draw up on a chalkboard in front of a teacher and talk about how they were drawing. So they would have to explain what they were doing as they were doing it. And that would be test two for drawing from a plaster cast. The same thing would happen with the live model. So timed and then on a blackboard explaining. And then the same thing would happen in drawing architectural features. Same thing would happen if they were drawing an ornament, so drawing a vase. So this would go on and on. And depending on how they did in that, that would determine where they would sit to draw in the auditorium. So sometimes you'll see in the exhibition two kind of studies of the same thing. And that's because one artist was sitting in front and one artist was sitting to the side using that same model. So keeping that in mind, and I know we're virtual, so you can sit wherever you want <laughs> in front of your screen to the side, however you wanna do it. We're gonna talk about our first piece and get into our first activity. So at the museum, we have a, a collection of Roman and Greek art. So all of the casts were Roman works, cast of Roman works. This is not a cast. This is an actual sculpture from our collection of um, Caligula, uh, Little Boots. Um, and this is on view in our Cochrane court. So I'm just going to show you what it looks like in person um, and a baby for scale. So this is in our um, Cochrane Court, and he's pretty, pretty life-size. He's on a pedestal, um, and it's one of two full-length sculptures of Caligula in the whole world. So the other is in Italy, um, and, and the, this one obviously is at the museum. So we'll come back to, to our guy here. And plaster cast um, gave students the opportunity to um, study from the classics, and that was the way the Ecole wanted to be. You know, they were really um, focused on classical art, classical subject matter. So not only are they learning from sort of studying something still and studying um, folds and details um, that you could really get into with this, but also the, the positions that these classical sculptures were in would then influence the composition of future paintings, which the Ecole really, at this time, was really into historical subject matter, mythological subject matter, biblical subject matter. So the subject matter, the pose, and the details all fed into kind of the ultimate goal, right, coming out of the Ecole on how you would paint. So it made sense to, to do that from Roman copies, um, or in this case, um, an actual full-length sculpture of Caligula. So you can see his folds, the folds in his toga are really amazing. Again, all carved from marble. Now he is missing some things. Um, he's missing a nose, he's missing his arms, and there's a lot of theories on it, a couple theories on how this happened. Caligula was not a fan favorite <laughs> in Rome. Um, not a great guy. Um, he also didn't look like this, by the way. So this is an ideal por idealized portrait of him. Um, he descended from Caesar. So kind of the Caesar haircut is a symbol of that. 
writings at the time said he had a body of a goat and was very hairy. So um, this is embellished for sure. Um, but we kind of think about this as sort of his social media profile of the ancient times, right? You didn't have social media. So you had to do these portraits and put them in public squares, which this would have been. So people knew what the emperor looked like. Um, and he wanted to look his best. So he, he looks his best here. And so when he was murdered, um, it was, there's a theory that he, you know, statues were pushed over and that's how he got damaged, but it also could just be, you know, over time um, or, you know, how, how it was, how it was fell over, et cetera. So we're, we're not really sure if that was a motivation, but that is a possibility. The other thing with this one is his head has been reattached. And we actually did a study a few years ago to make sure that it was reattached in the right way. And Caligula is one of uh, one of two full-length sculptures of him that exist in the world. And we have one here. Um, his head has been reattached. And on our website, um, on our learn site, if you go to vmfa.museum, there's a tab that says learn. And you can click on that and go to our resource site. And if you search by Caligula, there's tons of information on the conservation process that this sculpture went through. To, we actually deattached his head and then studied kind of the markings on the neck to make sure that they matched up with the markings on the head and then reattached it in the, in the right position. Um, and all of that is documented with video and um, other printed materials. So if you're interested in conservation and want to get more information into how Caligula came to be, definitely check that out. From that conservation, we also know that he was painted. Like all Roman sculpture and Greek sculpture, they were painted. So bright, bright colors. We knew he had a purple toga, he had flesh tone paint, his hair was painted brown. So it really stood out in that town, in that town square. So I'm going to actually turn it over to Amy. I'm going to stop sharing and she's going to walk us through this, the first drawing exercise with our friend Caligula. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Atelier de Zoom. Um, <laughs> you are all now my pupils in this academy. And I have pulled up here a my pen, my version of pen and paper, which is going to be digital so you guys can see it, but hopefully you all have access to just a pencil and some paper. It can be whatever paper you have around, computer paper. And we're going to do a drawing exercise looking at our full-length marble statue. At this atelier, we only have the best. Um, they had plaster casts. We have an actual marble sculpture. Uh, so we're going to do a drawing exercise today that I do with my drawing students. Uh, I think it is the best way to learn how to draw. Um, it is a very good step one, and I promise that you can all do it. So I would love it if you would try if you have access to a pencil. Um, we are going to do a blind contour drawing of Caligula. And what this exercise does is it trains your hand-eye coordination. Um, I, what we're going to do is we're going to look at Caligula here, and we are going to use our eyeballs to carefully observe the contours of Caligula around his head, around all of those folds, anywhere you perceive a line, so in the shadows of the folds, in the highlights, around the outline of his body. And as we carefully run our eyes over that, we are going to pretend that our eyes are connected to the tip of our pencil. And so we are going to pick a spot. I'm going to, I'm going to start, I'm going to start on his eye and I'm going to carefully look. And as I observe his eye, I'm going to observe the little shadow near his eye and go up. And then I'm going to see his forehead. And while I'm doing this, I'm not looking at my paper at all, or in this case, my screen at all. I am just looking at the artwork and carefully observing every little nook and cranny that I can and going very, very slowly. It's gonna look like a, a crazy, crazy little mess of lines, but that's okay. Um, we're in training. This is like, if you are a sports player running basketball drills, this is the art version of running drills. Um, this is just, we're 
we're practicing our skills of observation. We're practicing drawing. And if you can, while you're doing this, try not to lift your pencil up off the paper. If you do have to, like right now, I, I'm getting stuck. I'm getting back to his eyeball. I'm going to pick up my pen, not look at my paper, and start somewhere else, maybe on his mouth. Just put my pencil back down vaguely where I think it should go. It probably looks pretty crazy and all wrong, but that is okay. That is not, not the concern right now. The concern is just carefully observing this object and all of its little shadows and all of its little contours. Yeah. Get his little cheekbone. Yeah. Yeah, that looks like a crazy little mess of lines, but the art that happened happened in my brain when I was looking at this statue, observing it and practicing using my pencil with my brain and my eyeballs all working together as one piece. So if you would like, and I would very much like it if you would take a minute, um, let's take like three minutes and see if we can all try a blind contour of Caligula and see how far you get with that. Okay, ready, go. All right, time. That's been about three minutes. Started at 11.19. Um, hopefully you enjoyed that uh, or learned something from it in um, the atelier or in the école that you were in. You would have been allowed to look at your paper. You would have been going for accuracy. But in our école, we are going for just an introduction to drawing and observation. So thank you for joining me in that activity. And I'm going to pass my screen back to Celeste. Thanks, Amy. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed that. And okay, so after you have sat and passed your plaster cast drawing, um, you would go to a live model and we're, we're gonna kind of skip that step, sort of incorporate it into um, our copying a painting. So, in that uh, kind of steps that I showed you earlier, you know, you do plaster, then live model, and then begin painting. And part of the painting tutelage was actually copying from old masters at the Louvre. And the great thing about that is that women and men could go into the Louvre and do that. Um, so um, a picture that you maybe have, we saw earlier was a picture actually of women painting in the Louvre. So I'll go back to that. It's this painting here. So you can see women um, painting from old masters there. So, um, I mean, the MFA is just as good as the Louvre in many ways. Uh, so we're going to go into um, the galleries virtually in a minute. Um, but first I wanted to show you an example of this process that is actually on view in the Whistler Cassatt show. So on the left is a painting by James McNeil Whistler. Um, and he um, did this while he was in the Ecole, painted at from a work of art at the Louvre. And that work of art is on the right, it's by Ong. And it's Roger delivering uh, or freeing Angelica. And this is a story um, from the Breton region in France mythological story where Roger um, sees Angelica here, um, or Angelique, um, chained to a rock about to be devoured by a monster and he swoops in on a griffin and kills the monster and frees um, Angelique. Um, so uh, Whistler focused in on just one aspect of the painting and this is for a couple of reasons and Amy pointed one of these reasons out, um, which I didn't even think about, but now it totally makes sense. 
is, you know, you can't exactly do a one-to-one -one copy of a master, especially now that gets into copyright infringement and things like that. But also thinking about the time it would have taken for um, Whistler to have copied in this entire painting, you know, and fit this entire um, canvas in the loop was not going to happen. So you have to do a smaller scale, you know, when you're when you're copying or when you're in the galleries. We limit a size, for example, if you're sketching in the galleries to like a drawing board, the same thing would have happened then at the loop. So he's focusing in on Angelique here and you can see some similarities. Um, the color palette's a little bit different. The waves are a little bit different. So, um, but again, this is sort of practicing the skills after you've done a base of figure drawing and drawing from a plaster gas because you always are going to start with drawing and then work your way to painting. So they're not, you know, just one day showing up and painting this um, on the canvas. They're working their way up to this step of painting. So for our purposes, we're going to, we picked an old master, you know, again, you're gonna, you're gonna kind of go from the, the best here. Um, this is Bathsheba at her bath by Francesco Solomena, who is an Italian artist. So this is on view in our great hall. And um, he was um, practiced mostly in Italy. Um, so he taught at, um, in Florence, and then he actually was commissioned to do work by um, the King of France, so King Louis at the time. So this is the 17th century, 18th century work, excuse me. Um, and again, it's a classical or a biblical scene. So something that you know, you're going to gravitate towards as a student to copy from because you're being trained to do similar work after you graduate from the Ecole. And of course, the professors at the time are going to be looking for things like this because they want to see that you're going to measure up and be able to do a historical scene or a biblical scene. So it makes sense to, to pick something like this to work from. So this painting um, depicts a scene from the Bible. So Bathsheba at her bath. Um, so here she is bathing. And then all the way at the top corner, we see a figure here on, the, on a balcony overlooking what's taking place and that is King David. And so he sees Bathsheba and says, bring her to me. Now Bathsheba is already married. He knows this because he's married, she's married to a general who is fighting for him at the front and they visit together and she becomes pregnant and he sends word to her husband, like, you got to come back home. You know, we got to make, make this look like this is your child. And her husband says, no, I'm, I'm dedicated to fighting and my men here, and he dies, and then Bathsheba and King David eventually have King Solomon. So popular story, um, and everything in here, um, the way that the people are posed were probably drawn from life, but there's also, again, there's going to be influences from classical sculpture. We see classical architecture here, and then here. Um, and then symbolism, um, we've got the dog here, which is a symbol of fidelity. And you can see if he's sort of surprised or maybe startled in attack mode. And fidelity, of course, um, should be a surprise in attack mode because it's being questioned here um, by what's about to take place next. So that's a symbol there. And there's also these flowers here in the corner look a little wilted, you know, I'm sure there's symbols in there and what kind of flowers they are, but I haven't looked into it uh, very deeply, but everything here has a meaning. Um, and that's going to be important for, again, how you're being trained when you're being trained to do historical or mythological or biblical events, you're going to understand what the iconography is and be trained in that way as well. So um, Amy, um, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about um, our next practice, which sort of is a combo of what you may do with a live person, <laughs> a live figure drawing, um, but also looking at how this painting was, was made by uh, Solomena. So I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Amy. Awesome. Hello again. We are back in our Zoom Ecole. And at this point now you have graduated from doing blind contours and studying plaster casts. And we have moved on to studying uh, from life and or from paintings. 
as Celeste mentioned, the first thing we are going to have to learn how to do when drawing figures is learning how to do some gesture drawings. And a gesture drawing, the goal of the gesture drawing is to get the general pose of the figure, the general like mood and tone and pose, lay out how you know gravity is affecting these figures, how they're sitting, figure out how their hip bones and shoulders are situated in the page or in the painting. Um, and many, many paintings started this way and still start this way with many, many uh, gesture drawings to lay out the figures, make sure everything looks correct on the page before you commit it to paint and really go in on it. And so a gesture drawing, they can look pretty silly. They can look a lot like stick figures, but how they start generally, um, I usually start with the head. Heads are ovals, right? Heads are ovals. Then you gotta give, I'm gonna be working from Bathsheba over here. So I'm gonna be looking at her specifically, and we're gonna do a gesture drawing of the pose that she's in. So I've got her head, it's tilted at here at an angle. And then I'm gonna look for her neck. Can be one, maybe two lines. And then this part, the shoulders are really vital. So we're gonna look at the angle her shoulders are at. They sort of are going like this on a slant. The next thing we look at in that is in the spine, which is going on a curve here, cause she's sitting. So her spine is sticking out a little and then those hip bones are sort of going at the opposite angle of her shoulders, which is really interesting and important to note if you're gonna be making a drawing of someone. And then we see, you know, her, her hip bone is connected to her leg bone. You can sing the little song if you, if you want, but you get her, uh, you know, her thigh to her knee and then her knee to, their, to her ankle and then to her little foot. And then that other leg we see comes down, that knee goes, that leg is at less of an angle, I'm noticing that knee is further down, it crosses over the front, and then this foot very elegantly drapes over here. And we get to the arms, this arm is kind of going straight, almost straight down, bending a little, and her hand is resting on that leg. This arm, bent and meeting that other hand right in her lap to hold that little cloth. Um, and that that is your basic gesture drawing. That is really all you need to get down to understand these figures in space. But after that, if you feel so compelled, you can add, you know, some some meat on the bones is how I think of it. She's got, you know, she's three dimensional. We're three dimensional creatures. So you got to add in just some block in her arm, make her three-dimensional, her little, her little hip bone goes here, and that is really how you start blocking in an understanding. And then, you know, eventually you could erase out the lines you don't, you decide you didn't need. There you go. And so that is a basic figure drawing, uh, figure gesture drawing to get the idea of the pose you can add. She can have a little hair and maybe an ear. You'd block in maybe, I'm getting too involved with this. I'm starting to build an actual drawing because it's really fun and addictive to start building drawings from the ground up. Um, so I'd like to invite you all to do this activity, this exercise. It's very much okay if you want to um, just stick to stick figures. That is perfectly acceptable. If you don't want to start with the head, you don't have to. I'm going to be looking, looking at her right now. Um, maybe get her little, little head. She has a fun curvy spine. And her shoulders are going at opposite angles, which is actually something that the old masters did a lot. I believe it's called contrapasto, where your shoulders go one way and your hips go the other. That's fun. So look for that. That happens all the time. And uh, yeah, let's take another couple minutes to, to look at these and do some gesture drawings and get some sketches going in our Zoom, Zoom atelier.
And Bathsheba is great to draw from because you can see she's nude and nudes are great to draw from, especially at this time period because there is some anatomy guesswork when the women are wearing clothes that, you know, dress them in such volume, you really have to have an understanding of the figure that's underneath in order to figure out where their limbs might be situated. And Amy, when, and that would make sense then for students to start kind of plaster cast to live figure, a live figure nude, and then into copying a painting, because they would have that kind of base knowledge. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the other thing about learning from plaster casts is you can start to learn an idealized form and sort of get that in your head. Uh, we still do teach drawing students the idealized human figure. It's, you know, eight heads tall, you can take certain measurements, almost like the Vitruvian man. Um, and then you have that base to work from to then observe, oh, this person is different. Nobody looks like the Vitruvian man. Nobody looks like the ideal. But having sort of a ref, a good solid reference to work from to then tweak to look like what you're trying to draw is really helpful. And that's another thing that gesture drawings help with is getting you comfortable with, you know, how far are the shoulders from the hips? Generally speaking, how far is the head from the feet? How big are feet comparison to hands? You know, you don't want to have giant footed people with itty bitty little hands that would look like a clown. Yay. Okay, great. Awesome. I hope you guys enjoyed that activity. It's very much uh, something that they would have done in the academy. And uh, I'm going to pass it back to Celeste now. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see Bathsheba again, sort of on the big screen. So Bathsheba um, is hung in our galleries salon style. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, this is not our galleries. <laughs> This is, this is the uh, Paris Salon, and the Salon was sort of the art event of the year in Paris. And you would either get in, you get invited to display at the Salon or submit work um, and then get judged, and um, the winners would be displayed at the Salon. And uh, that's where the phrase, uh, a Salon hang comes from. It looked like this. So paintings were stacked upon, you know, one another. And where your painting was, you know, if it was at eye level, it was considered really, really good. If the further up or, you know, it was okay. A lot of that depended on size as well. Um, so that's where everyone, you know, if you came out of the a hole, um, that was the other big goal besides commissions was to get into the salon. And a lot of the works downstairs, uh, sorry, in the, in the list of the cassette show um, were in the salon. Um, and what else could happen is if your painting was in the salon, then that would make it more, um, get it more fame, obviously, get it noticed. And sometimes museums would buy from the salon. So the French museums would buy. So the first room in the Whistler Cassatt show are works that were purchased from the salon or purchased by museums directly from the artist. The second uh, uh, room is about learning at the a hole. So some of the works we've seen are in that space. And then the third room is sort of a recreation of the salon. And so works that are in that space would have been on view in the salon. So, um, but this became kind of how museums would hang their works as well. So very influential. And here is Bathsheba in our salon in the Great Hall. So just to give you reference, um, if you haven't seen it or you wanna go visit the museum after this today and draw from life, that's totally allowed. So you can do that and there she is. And then the next work we're going to look at is just opposite Bathsheba, hung in salon style as well. And it's this piece right here. So we're gonna take a closer look. And we have The Judgment of Paris by Francois-Xavier Fab, And he was a French artist. And he was 
a student at the Ecole. So this is where kind of you wanted to, to be. So everyone who came, now this is 18th century, he was at the Ecole. This work is from about 1807 to 1808. Um, and he was did what we just talked about. He was a pupil first, um, then became a student, went through all of the same steps that we've talked about and we sort of modeled here today. So drew from plaster cast, went um, to life modeling and then draw, you know, painting from the Louvre. He was also trained by Jacques-Louis David, who was a neoclassical painter. Um, and so it makes sense that he would choose a neoclassical subject. Now, the other cool thing is, is he, as a student, won the Prix de Rome at the Ecole. And the Prix de Rome was like the tip top award, sort of valedictorian of the Ecole. And that allowed him to go to the Academy in Rome, which is, you know, the OG Academy uh, for training. And he then trained there. Um, and um, became very famous artist and got commissions. He submitted this work to the salon in 1807 or 1808, excuse me, and it actually won a medal. So this is kind of the success story of a student from the Ecole we're looking at here. And like I mentioned, it is a, you know, what they were aiming for, being trained for, especially at this time, was historical or mythological or biblical scenes. And here we have a scene from mythology, very popular story. And it's it has a moral. Um, that was another reason that these were prized. You know, at the time, art was seen as something that could instruct you morally, uh, sort of like social justice movements today, um, using art to do the same thing, sort of impart an idea. Same thing was happening um, in, in old masters right through um, the 19th century, early 19th century, mid 19th century. Um, and here we have Paris on the left, and he is being visited by three goddesses. Um, and again, symbolism is key here. So they have attributes that let us know who they are. So first on the left, Cupid is with her. She's half naked, it's Venus. In the middle, uh, we have Athena or um, um, Minerva, also known as, um, so the goddess of war. Um, and she has a helmet on, and her torch is at her feet. And then we have um, Juno or um, the wife of Jupiter or Hera. And she's got a peacock next to her. That's how we know it's her. Um, and all of them are promising Paris something. And the reason they are has to do with the apple that is that he is holding that Venus is being awarded by him. And way up in the corner, you know, we love things in the corner. Here we have winged Mercury and he is just leaving because he has just delivered the apple. The apple. Um, and on the apple says to the fairest and Zeus or Jupiter has delivered this to Paris for him to pick which of these three goddesses are the most, is the most beautiful? I would not want to be in his position, but all of them are bribing him with something like a gift. So Hera over here says, I will give you um, power and uh, wealth. So pointing kind of to the city um, or you know, ruling the city. Um, she is giving him wisdom, so kind of pointing to the, to the heavens or her helmet. And then Venus says, well, actually, I'll give you the love of any fair maiden that you would like because, you know, he's human and can't be with the gods. So he goes for her. And the female that he chooses or the most loveliest person that he wants to be with is Helen of Troy. And that is how the Trojan War starts. So the moral of the story is, if you are invited to choose who's the fairest, don't do it. So, <laughs> so it's hard to pick who. So he's, again, and this would be sort of a composition that um, Jacques-Louis David would have done. You know, it's, it's kind of, they're on a stage. They're, the story is laid out for you. Um, it's based on classical myth. They're very much in classical poses, you know, arms raised, contrapo that contrapposto um, that Amy was talking about. So, and, and we know that this was a successful painting because it won a, won a prize at the salon. So it was praised for kind of reaching that, that pinnacle of what was considered good art. And 
the salon and the école were who were determining that. Um, and that shift that that of course changes with impressionism, who's kind of turning all of this on its side and saying, you know, we don't have to paint these scenes. We want to paint from life. We want to paint what's in front of us. It doesn't have to be precise. It doesn't even have to have figures in it, you know. Um, and it really shifted the A. Cole and criticism, art criticism um, overall. And so Amy, I'm gonna, you know, feel free to jump to jump in. We're not gonna switch screens because we're gonna talk about that, that idea of art criticism as our final activity. Yeah, um, art, I'm gonna jump in and say art criticism is perhaps the most valuable thing that you get from going to an art school or in a call or a, Nowadays, they're called residencies, um, and they're much quicker, which is what mine, I visited the um, Virginia Atelier at the Cité Internationale des Arts in Paris, France, and I'm so sorry that I'm very bad at pronouncing French words, um, despite having spent two months there, um, and I was much better at speaking French in France, um, but I have very much lost my ear for the accent but being nowadays the way that we do critiques is very much um it, the virginia atelier um so that's that french word that means school basically um nowadays we get our critiques less so from um one big école and more so from our peers and that uh, goes all the way back to, as Celeste was saying, the Impressionists, who really were a group of peers um, who got together and said, you know what, I like what we're doing. I think what we're doing has value. And they put together something called the Salon de Refusé, which was the Salon of Rejects. They had all been rejected from the big salon show, but they got together, rented a space, hung their work, and invited the city. Uh, and the city came and the city was impressed and they loved this work. It was colorful. It, ha it captured the feeling of a moment. It was of not of these big stage set almost that almost looked like plays, um, but it was of things that the people would see in everyday life. And so the people then were able to offer their critique uh, in terms of purchasing what they liked, writing about what they liked, talking about what they liked. And so today that sort of community aspect is important um, on a much smaller scale. In art school, you have big critique days instead of exams and you hang your work up in a like a temporary gallery and you and your peers talk about the work. Um, and you, you will talk about the same things that the old masters talked about. You will talk about um, technical issues or technical prowess that might be present in your painting. You might talk about things like, I think the anatomy is wrong, or I think, you know, you could have had higher contrast or work on your composition. But more so today, in today's culture, what's important is the content. And you will talk about, you know, how this painting makes people feel, what, what meaning they're deriving from looking at these works. Uh, and you know how how this artwork will be viewed and received by the world. Um, and in that regard, traveling to Paris was very helpful because they are a new set of peers. And the more different eyes, the more different critiques you can have on your work, the better it is for you as an artist who is learning. Um, and you get to pick and choose now because there is no Nicole. You get to pick and choose whose critiques you want to listen to and whose opinions you value. Um, you know, we have today still newspapers and magazines, Style Magazine often writes about uh, art happening in the city. So there's sort of a modern source of critique we have going on. But yeah, that I think those are my words on critique. Celeste, I don't know if you have anything to add or any questions. No, that, that's definitely a good summary. And again, you know, the critique for Fab would have been great. <laughs> so he's doing very well. And actually he did so well um, 
he donated a lot of his paintings to the city of Montpellier, which is where he's from, and they created a museum there named after him. So you can see that go to the museum fob um, and see his work. Um, so nice museum connection too. So artists, you know, could really pave the way uh, for museum collections as well. Well, I wanna um, thank Amy so much for um, your expertise and sharing your experience um, at the Ecole in Paris and everyone here for being here and being our pupils uh, for about an hour. So again, I really appreciate everyone's participation and joining us today and um, keep practicing, keep practicing your gesture drawings and your um, contour drawings. And again, I'll do a plug for Amy. Her class is full this summer, but our fall registration will be opening in August. So definitely look for that and look for her classes. That catalog should be out. Oh, I hope soon. And so um, if you want more from Amy, definitely check out her classes and any class at the studio school. Um, we do that in all different mediums. So great. Thank you all. Thank you for your comments. So I really, again, appreciate everyone and have a great day. Bye. Bye. Thank you.